Hello and welcome. I am Simon Redig, Associate Curator for the Arts of the Islamic World at the Freer Gallery of Art and Arthur M. Sackler Gallery, the Smithsonian's National Museum of Asian Art. I am delighted to welcome you today to our lunchtime series, Sneak Peek, New Research from the Freer and Sackler. Each month, staff members present in-depth personal perspectives and discuss ongoing research connected to works in the Freer and Sackler collections. It is an insider's view at original, unpublished, and developing ideas from our curators, conservators, and scientists. Lectures will be followed by a Q&A, taking live questions from the audience. In today's program, revealed by Moonlight, Shapeshifters in Japanese Woodblock Prints, Kid Brooks, the Japan Foundation Assistant Curator of Japanese Art investigates 19th century Japanese woodblock prints that explore the theme of shapeshifting. From bombastic warriors heroes to lonely monstrous figures, the enormous amount of such grotesque imagery produced at this time is often attributed to the psychological states of the artists but is better understood as a general taste for the bizarre that continues to thrive today. I am delighted to introduce our speaker now. Kit Brooks joined the Smithsonian's National Museum of Asian Art in November 2019 and has previously held positions at the British Museum, Harvard Art Museums, and the Children's Museum in Boston. They curated the exhibition Uncanny Japan the Art of Yoshitoshi at the Worcester Art Museum and co-curated Living Proof, drawing in 19th century Japan at the Pulitzer Arts Foundation. At the museum, Kit is currently preparing exhibitions of 19th and 20th century print artists and an installation of bird paintings to open in the Freer Gallery of Art in 2022. A specialist in prints and paintings of the Edo and Meiji periods, Dr. Brooks holds a PhD in, Japan, in Japanese art history from Harvard University. The primary research interests revolve around the re-evaluation of eccentric artists of the 18th century, as well as the relationship between illustrated books and paintings and special prints that emulate the visual qualities of other media, such as surimono and takuhanga. Kit is currently researching the 20th century Japanese artists Ayo and Amaguchi Yozo. Kit, the floor is yours. Thank you. So thank you, Simon, for that introduction and to everyone that has joined in to join us today. And thank you especially to the Sneak Peek team, Sana Mirza and Lily Stein, Lizzie Stein, and to our technician, Andy Finch, for working behind the scenes to make sure everything runs flawlessly. The image that I'm opening with is a well-known print from the series 100 Aspects of the Moon <clears throat> by that master of the macabre, Tsukiyoka Yoshitoshi. Yoshitoshi is somewhat notorious for his depictions of the ghostly and the grotesque, and his biography is surrounded by stories of an unstable personal life. Particularly in his later years, he suffered from some mental health issues, and his cause of death in 1892 is listed <clears throat> in some contemporary newspapers as being a mental disorder. This background has always imbued his later print series, like this one, with a level of melancholy that seems to reach out from across the boundary between life and death. Not only does this series focus on ghostly and supernatural encounters, often with the kind of hazy dreamlike atmosphere that you can see in this print and all occurring beneath the light of the moon, but also because it was published from October 1885 to April 1892, just a couple of months before his death and during his final illness. Such a context of gothic horror is all fun and good, but we shouldn't let lurid personal details overshadow the remarkable accomplishments made in these prints. Artistic feats that result from the foresight of the publisher, Akiyama Buemon, and the collaboration of Yoshitoshi as the designer with the skills and the sensitivities of the block carver and the printer. These latter individuals are not always named in Japanese woodblock prints. But here the carver is given as Yamamoto Shinji, who was actually a pupil of Yoshitoshi and also a printer. 
There are many things that we might overlook if we focus only on an artist's backstory or on the balance of the compositional elements in the design. For instance, whenever I see this print, I am transfixed by the delicacy of the clouds passing over the moon. This light wash effect that's achieved by inking the block with incredibly diluted ink, which makes this area look slightly different in each different impression. The autumn grasses are depicted in these translucent shades of black that in places have the appearance of having been made by the split fibers of a paintbrush. This apparent movement of a brush is also echoed in the strokes of fur on the box on the fox's body. And these light touches might make us forget that they are not in fact softly painted lines, but that they have been chiseled and carved from a hard block of cherry wood. And there are other details. There is this cluster of purple flowers in the lower left, this subtle, beautiful touch that we might not even notice at first glance when we see the print, but which would have required carving a separate color block just for this small area and just for a color that is not repeated anywhere else on the print. In the opposite corner, we have the title cartouche. The series title is given in the box in pink, 100 Aspects of the Moon, Tsuki Hyakushi. And then in the cream colored box, the title of the specific print, Musashi Moon. And I'm sure on your screen, this beige box looks as unremarkable as it does on mine. But this is another example of why with woodblock prints, you really have to get up close and you have to see them in person. This area employs this technique of nuno mezuri or textile weave printing. This technique uses a swatch of fabric which is glued onto the woodblock. <clears throat> that fabric is left uninked and the paper is made very wet. When the paper is rubbed from the back with the baden on and onto the block, the wet paper is forced into the fabric so that it takes up the shape of the weave. And then when the paper dries, that textured surface remains for this subtle, delicate and quite beautiful effect that recalls the embossed papers that have been used in poetry albums since the Heian period. You can often see details like this in the deluxe editions of print issued during the late 19th century, and it's always worth looking out for, as it gives us a sense of the level of care and expertise that went into these prints, even though they were mass produced works. And so after all of that, what is the subject? From the title, we, are no, we know that we are on the Musashi Plain, which is west of Tokyo. The Musashi Plain has long been famous in Japan as it is the supposed site of a well-known episode in the Tales of Ise, which is a 10th century collection of poems with a loose narrative that became one of the most influential classics of Japanese literature. In this particular story, episode 12, a pair of lovers elope hiding in the tall grasses <clears throat> to escape pursuit by the authorities and by the woman's family. And I say lovers and elope, but he abducted her. And she pleads with their pursuers not to set fire to the grasses of the plain, which the authorities have been threatening to do in order to drive them out. Misashi was thereafter often depicted with these tall rippling grasses under the light of a full moon, which is depicted here in this screen in silver foil, giving this ethereal evocative effect. In our Yoshitoshi print, a fox gazes at its own reflection in the water, illuminated by this similarly enormous bright moon. And foxes, or kitsune in Japanese, are transformative creatures, not fully wild, and they're always just visible on the fringes of human settlement. When Hiroshige depicted the famous landmarks of the shogun's capital, <clears throat> For his series 100 Famous Views of Edo, he chose the Enoki or Hackberry tree for the orgy area, a site where it was thought that large numbers of foxes gathered. And foxes are believed to be the messengers of the deity Inari, and there has been a shrine dedicated to this uh, to Inari at that site for centuries. In more recent years, a fox procession is held every new year to commemorate this tradition that's depicted in Hiroshige's print. Foxes were believed to be able to emit light from their tails, these so-called foxfires or kitsunebi. And these kinds of processions were often thought to be bridal processions where a wedding between foxes was taking place. Foxes were also believed to be able to transform into humans. And this is another print from that same 100 Aspects of the Moon series called Cry of the Fox. In this story, a fox is being pursued by a hunter 
and so in order to escape, the fox decides to outwit him. The fox transforms into the hunter's uncle, who happens to be a Buddhist monk, and he launches into a spirited sermon to his hunter nephew about why he must stop killing foxes because they will turn into vengeful spirits. With the hunter suitably rebuked, the fox is able to make his escape. And then when the hunter hears the distinctive call of a fox in the distance, he knows that he has been tricked. In this print, we see the monk transforming back into a fox, with a fox's face, but with human hands and feet. The half moon in the sky is also suggestive of a part way transformation, a metamorphosis that is not yet fully complete. But perhaps the most famous shape-shifting fox in Japanese history is Kuzunoha, shown here in another series by Yoshitoshi in mid-transformation. In this story, a 10th century nobleman, Abe no Yasuna, was outside an Inari shrine when he sees a fox being chased by hunters who want to use its liver to make into medicine. The fox looks at him with pleading eyes and without a moment's hesitation, Yasuna hides the fox in his robes. The hunters move on and the fox safely escapes. Shortly after, he meets a mysterious, beautiful woman from out of nowhere. They fall in love and she bears him a son. And I'm sorry for the spoiler, but the beautiful woman was the grateful fox all along. But eventually she must return to the forest, leaving her son and her husband behind. And Yoshitoshi has depicted the moment of transformation when the shadow cast on the paper sliding door reveals her true form. Knowing this transformational ability of foxes, what could this mean for our Musashi image? To me, this undulating black shadow that surrounds the fox is suggestive of how unstable a fox's body is, that it's radiating with the possibility that it's morphing into something else. This shadowy shape is actually slightly different in different impressions of the print. So it's almost as though the fox is morphing across all the versions of the print that exist throughout the world. The illumination from the moon is allowing the fox to see itself as it gazes at its own reflection, lifting one paw to its head in this almost self-conscious gesture. However, this is more than a gesture, as the fox is actually placing some green weeds on its head, which in some folk tales was an ingredient that foxes needed in order to be able to make their transformations. The green pigment that has been used here is not very much different from the black of the grasses, so it's a little difficult to see. Though it's clearer in the reflection that there is something fibrous on top of the fox's head. I say that it's clearer, but I'm sure right now you're probably squinting at your screen and cursing at me because you can't see these weeds at all, but I did anticipate this. And luckily we have two impressions of this print in our collection. So I thought, oh, I'll show that other one instead but you can't really see it here either. <clears throat> and at this point, I started to doubt myself that the detail that I remembered really was there. And so I have to thank our collection manager, Brian Abrams, for letting me into storage last week to grab a detail in a slightly different light that allows you to see the green just a little bit more clearly. A more obvious example of this foxy phenomena is shown here in a print by Ohara Koson. With something like a giant cabbage leaf on its head, this fox looks pretty playful. And in Japanese folk tales, foxes are usually more mischievous than sinister. We also have two versions of this print, but unlike with that other comparative example, which is a bit unhelpful, here the difference between the two impressions is clear. The impression on the right employs extra color blocks uh, to depict the background grasses and this inky ground plane. But back to our fox, what is she transforming into? And I say she because foxes are almost always female. I mentioned the fox woman, Kuzunoha, um, who abandoned her child when she returned to being a fox. That child grew up to be a legendary magician, magician Abe no Seme, and it is made clear that his superhuman abilities are an inheritance from his magical mother. And one of the feats that he uh, performed as a court magician was curing the Emperor Toba, who had been enchanted by yet another fox, Tamamonomae, who was a nine-tailed fox. There are exceptions to everything, and earlier when I said that foxes were mostly mischievous, <clears throat> which is true, however, if a fox lives to be a thousand years old, it grows nine tails, and these foxes are usually malevolent, as we can see here when Tamamonomae's true identity had been revealed. 
A more elegant presentation of this sinister character, Tamawana Mae, is shown in this surimono, which is a genre of prints usually commissioned by poets for circulation and exchange among themselves and other poetry groups. Because they were privately commissioned and financed, they often feature luxury print effects like embossing and metallic pigments. Here, metallic pigments have been used to create a mirror that reflects the true nature of the emperor's favorite concubine. In this print, which was commissioned by members of the Taiko Gawa Poetry Group, uh, one of the poems makes reference to her nine tales and plays off the, the connection of how the fire from her tail blooms like flowers. Speaking of reflective surfaces, another Yoshitoshi composition shows how a reflection in water can reveal one's true nature. What seems to be a beautiful woman is shown by her reflection to be, in fact, a grotesque demon. This print references another story, but with a more delicate take than is standard. Our hero, Taira no Korimochi, was charged by the emperor to find and kill a demon that had been terrorizing uh, Mount Togakushi. In a no play that's based on this story, the warrior is wandering through the falling autumn leaves, which we can also see in this print, when he sees a beautiful princess and her attendants having a feast in the woods as they enjoy the turning colors of the leaves. They invite him to join, which he does, and he drinks a lot of alcohol and falls asleep. In his dream, he receives a warning from the deity Hachiman, who says that the princess, surprise, surprise, is actually the demon that he's been sent to kill. And in the dream, he gives him a sword. Koremochi wakes up unsheathing this magical sword just as she attacks, and he's able to kill her. Most prints depict this moment of awakening and discovery, where we see the demon's true form and Koremochi's heroic slash, which is too fast for our eyes to capture. But Yoshitoshi's print on the left is a little different, diverging from the known sequence of the story by showing Koremochi figuring out the princess's true identity through her reflection. This vertical diptych format increases the sense of drama and the distorted power dynamic between them, as this seemingly stately woman is actually this spectral menace that towers over the crouched warrior. The tension is so intense, the leaves fall around them like it's in a movie. Kolimochi is drawing his sword. We know what is about to happen. And Yoshitoshi is relying on that knowledge so that we as the viewers compute, uh, complete the narrative for ourselves. Like many of Yoshitoshi's compositions, we can find sources or seeds of the idea in the work of his teacher, Utagawa Kuniyoshi. This print is not a vertical diptych or a composite of two sheets, but it's a narrower format, tanzaku, which is about 17 by 5 inches or 40 by 13 centimeters. This print comes from a series of 12, 12 prints to match the 12 animals of the Chinese zodiac. This print corresponds to the ox, and the connection is not immediately obvious. But here the ox is the skin that this figure is wearing like a cloak. I also wanted to include a bit of gender parody here because unlike in all the other examples, this is a disguised male. He is the 10th century bandit, Kidomaru, who refusing to serve the aristocracy, he went into the mountains to serve demons instead. He ambushed his victims by disguising himself in animal skins. There is a subtle red, red pigment that has been used to show his reflection in the water, and the overall mood is one of loneliness. Again, the scene and Kidomari's reflection is visible due to the light of the moon, this heavenly body that is both constant, but also constantly in flux. The setup that we saw earlier with Koremochi seeing the demonic countenance of the princess in the water again gets a more elegant treatment in another Surimono print. With subtler colours and a more playful tone, an elegantly dressed courtier has been startled by the appearance of a de demonic reflection in the water as he passes by. However, this is not a demon that he has been sent to dispatch, but merely the reflection of a festival kite that has been caught in the branches of the tree behind him. Although the moon is not depicted in the print, this line, it, which is unfortunately chopped off the second poem, explicitly mentions the reflection of moonbeams and the seen and the unseen. But transformation is not only for the subjects in the prints, but it can also apply to the legacy of the motifs within them. 
Another print from that 100 Aspects of the Moon series that we started with is this one, titled Kitayama Moon. It shows the 13th century courtier Toyohara Sumiyaki, who was a talented musician in the court of the Emperor Gokashi Wabara. Uh, he lost his way one night among the Kitayama Hills and he found himself surrounded by a pack of ferocious wolves. The legend says that he was undaunted and that he used the magic of his flute to calm the wolves, who then returned silently to the forest. However, here Sumiyaki's fear is palpable and this print shows our supposedly fearless hero cowering, trembling with a raised sleeve as if that is going to protect him. The moon eerily lights the scene and the shared pink color palette draws our eyes to the wolf's mouths where the moon's light is also illuminating their very sharp teeth. These wolves were again borrowed from a design by Yoshitoshi's teacher, Utagawa Kuniyoshi, of the legendary strongman Kamata Matahachi. In Kuniyoshi's design on the right, Matahachi brandishes a stone post that he is literally ripped out of the ground. The marks of the wet earth are still clearly visible on the lower part of the post. Matahachi's furrowed brow and his rippling muscles are very different from Sumiyaki's timid pose. Although many compositional elements are shared between both of these prints, we have the man, the moon, the wolves, our impression of these encounters is very different. Kuniyoshi, the teacher and the author of the image on the right, was known for his bombastic warrior prints, so his treatment is no surprise. Matahachi is heavily muscled, and although his muscles might look unconvincing to us today, this rippling, almost liquid uh, form they take is based on conventions from Buddhist sculpture about how muscles and strength were represented. So what is it that makes these two works feel so different? In Kuniyoshi's version on the right, I would argue that we want to identify with the warrior, with his feet of strength lifting the stake. We get the barest glimpse of his belongings behind him and we can see the moon so that we know we're outside, but we have no ground plane or scenery, so otherwise the setting is ambiguous. We don't care where we are. What matters is that we're watching this hero perform an incredible display of bravery and strength. In Yoshitoshi's version at left, we know from the title that the location is Kitayama and these waving autumn grasses, which are something of a trademark of Yoshitoshi, make this a particularly haunting scene. The courtier is cowering from the wolves. He's not beating them up. So who wants to identify with this guy? The dynamic of the compositional elements has also shifted. In Kuniyoshi's version, the wolves are looking up at the stake with what reads to me as shock and fear, which is understandable since it looks like Matahachi is going to smash them to bits with it. In Yoshitoshi's version, there is no stake being brandished and the wolves are looking at the moon. The pink clouds surrounding it is the same pink in the, in the wolves' mouths and it makes this simpatico between the two. And the courtier seems like he's an intruder in their space. And although the title of my talk promised prints, I love paintings just as much. And I want to end in a haunting and depressing way with this work in our collection by the Nihonga painter Suzuki Shonen. There is a similarity with the grasses and the moon from Yoshitoshi's print, enough so that I've wondered if this painting could have sprung from that same narrative episode. However, this is a far more sensitive ink portrait than in Yoshitoshi's print. And whereas the wolves in the, paint, in the print were yammering and howling with teeth bared ready to attack, this is different. We see the outline of the ribs and we really feel how this wolf is starving. Yes, his teeth are bared, but it is though they have been exposed, his lips and gums pull back from malnourishment, not aggression. Similarly, the claws are extended, but not to attack, as the skin has receded. The, wolf, the moon's light here seems to reveal the wolf's pathetic state. And why might that be so? Although the painting is not inscribed with the precise year that it was made, given the dates of the artist, we can assume that it was painted in the late 19th or early 20th century. This time period coincides with the decimation of the native wolf population in Japan, a species that once roamed wild through the nation's forests and mountains. In fact, the last recorded specimen of the Japanese wolf was in 1905, at which time the wolf was officially declared extinct. 
As with any extinction, there were many contributing factors, and I am absolutely not a zoologist, but it has been attributed to the scarcity of the wolves main food source, beer, during the late 19th century, which occurred due to population shifts and an increased demand for meat and leather. When the wolves started targeting horses instead, a bounty system was introduced with a financial reward being paid for each wolf carcass. In the Meiji period, killing wolves became a national policy as they were becoming increasingly infected with rabies, which was transmitted from domestic dogs. And this made them unpredictably aggressive towards humans. Dogs and wolves needed to be in physical proximity with one another for this transmission to be possible. And wolves had been driven so close to human settlement as a result of the huge amount of deforestation that occurred during Japan's industrialization. This has meant that for some artists, and perhaps Suzuki Shonen as well, the wolf became symbolic, another victim of Japan's modernization, with its disappearance representing the downside of rapid and unbridled industrialization. We might imagine this wolf as one of the last, chased from the forest and forced onto this open plain, driven by hunger or madness. And my final thought for today is to say that today is October the 12th, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention that on October the 20th, there will be a full moon. And when it rises, who knows what will be revealed by its light. So please, no wandering the woods, no meeting mysterious, beautiful princesses or getting drunk at their parties. And you can't say that we didn't warn you. Thank you. Thank you, Kit, for this captivating uh, presentation. Um, I will look at the moon on the 20th too then and <laughs> see what everyone also around my house there is only raccoons so you know it doesn't have the same that doesn't have the same effect um we have a lot of um questions so i'm and some are similar so i'm going to try to combine them so for the deluxe prints how big are the print runs and who are the primary buyers of those prints that's a great question and i always I always get scared by the ones that want very technical numbers and data about publishing uh, because we don't actually have concrete numbers about this. Um, and there is some amb ambiguity sometimes and it's difficult to make generalizations. But with the, with the case of the 100 aspects of the moon series, um, it, was, it was issued in the thousands and it was because it was issued over the course of seven years, there were actually announcements about um, the new prints that were coming out and that uh, Fox transforming print um, the moon, in the moonlight on Musashi Plain, that was one of the last group. Um, so when the print run initially started, they would issue a few thousand to see how popular it was. And when it became pretty guaranteed that this was gonna be a success, then you start seeing these advertisements for a deluxe set that will come bound, you know, bound in cloth. Um, but I can't give you an exact number. Several thousand. Several thousands. Huh. And so they were they were not mostly viewed by the or bought by the elites, right? They, they were they, they were basically works also for uh, popular works for um you know. Yeah, not, absolutely. So with Yoshitoshi, most of these prints are you know from the 1860s to the 18 early 1890s. And so this, you know, the status class system had collapsed and these were marketed to a very general audience. Hmm. Like us. <laughs> so um, on, on, on that note, you showed a couple of uh, surimono that have more uh, refined depictions and uh, of, of, these, um, of these stories than the commercial prints, actually. Mm -hmm. um, are those uh, supernatural subjects common in Surimono? Uh, yes and no. So I would say that there's not, they're not explicit in the horrific in the way that some of the commercial prints are. They tend to be of that more refined variety. And even in warrior prints, you might get this, you know, display of strength, but no one is being attacked or murdered horribly. Um, and I think that is usually attributed to the fact that these prints were often issued in the new year. Um, you know, for auspicious purposes and sent to people as like a New Year's greeting card. And uh, although I might send someone a greeting card with something horrible on it, I think, at the, you know, it's generally not seen as auspicious to send um, a supernatural or horrific encounter to set someone's year off with a bang. 
Um, so I think that's one of the reasons why for Sunni Mono, they tend to be a bit more elegant. Hmm. Um, more, uh, not technical questions, but Yoshi, Yoshitoshi's treatment of the subject of Yasumasa and Akamadare also seems to differ um, between his two triptychs of Yasumasa playing the flute and the 100 aspects version. Mm -hmm. Has he given such divergent depictions of other subjects? Uh, so yes, and differently throughout his career, actually. So one of the things that I like to do is look at the way that Yoshitoshi um, manipulates the same stories that his teacher did, but often changes um, the viewpoint, changes perspective, differs the dynamic. Um, so that is definitely something that you see. And with certain compositions, you can you can trace it throughout his career, how he keeps reworking the same theme to place a slightly different emphasis. And they do seem to get more contemplative, um, more emotional over time, and less just about this like you know physical clash. Hmm. Um, were these stories prepared in books or scrolls, or were the images to be interpreted without any much text, like the case here? Both. Um, so you do get these stories told in um, illustrated book and just books of text at the time, but some I'm, you know, I'm, I was being a little bit selective and a bit cheeky with my collection because I, I often like the ones that don't have much text in. Um, but Kuniyoshi, for example, you often get these large text boxes at the top, um, which which give you the story that's happening. Um, and it was kind of an innovation of uh, Yoshitoshi's publisher, this guy Akiyama Buemon, um, to reduce the amount of text to just give this like a small verse or a line and that to kind of evoke the idea. But these are, you know, very, very well known stories um you can kind of imagine like if you you know you see a boat and a big shark like we'd all know it's jaws like it's that can be that that level of familiarity that people would have had um why is the fox associated mostly with women uh i can't <laughs> we need it we need an anthropologist i think to tell us some of those reasons i think it's actually kind of interesting. So the two most shape-shifting animals um, that I would think of in Japan is you have foxes and then raccoon dogs or tanuki. And tanuki tend to be male and foxes tend to be female. Um, so there's a species division, a species preference, because I, I did say um, that there are exceptions to everything. And there are there have been a couple of male shape-shifting foxes that I've seen. So it's it's not exclusive. A general preference. So, do we have uh, any um, depiction of those uh, tanuki? Is that right? Um, of the of those um, male sort of version? Yeah, yeah. I think there's one in the um, Hundred Aspects of the Moon series as well. Um, they transform into priests quite a lot, um, as you do. Um, but I think the the association with foxes being women is also in Chinese folklore as well. So I think that definitely would have had an influence. And that character of Tamwana Maya, um, allegedly, according to some versions, you know, she's this globe trotting shape shifting fox that first appeared in India. And then she gets banished to China and she becomes the famous um, concubine Yangwe Fei. And then she gets banished to Japan. So um, and then she gets killed horribly. So. <laughs> and so the, the, the shape shifting is always from the beast to man or do we know like so there is no such thing than werewolves right basically the, the wolves that you presented are wolves and remain wolves they don't they don't shape shift and I'm fox always... foxes only sort of shift to the shape of a of a human being yeah i'm i'm always happy to be corrected and i'm sure someone will find some shape-shifting wolf um but i don't know any that so they were all, in some areas of japan they're also considered to be divine messengers that travel between you know the nap the physical world and the world of the deities and they tended to have a more divine existence and i don't know of any shape-shifters although i think there's been like a 
um, some more modern werewolf stories, but they're probably influenced from the West. And by that, I mean, you know, 20th century stories. I don't know any traditional ones, um, but that's not to say that there, there couldn't be one out there. The only occasion I can think of something happening the other way is there is a um, mythological creature called a kappa, which is like this turtle-ish, three feet tall creature that lives in rivers and will drown you if you get too close. And in some versions of the Kappa myth, those are people that turned into Kappa um, due to being on the fringes of human society for too long that they forget how to be a person. But that's not always the most conventional narrative. That's just one of the versions of how Kappa come to be. That's for next next year. We'll talk about that. <laughs> um, just for confirmation, you said that the um, the fox was transformed into a monk, male question mark, rather than a woman in the Yoshitoshi transformation, right? Yes. Oh, he was the uncle of the... Yes, of the but uncle. I think the fox, the fox might have been female, but that doesn't mean you can't transform into a male. Okay. Oh, that's, a, that's an interesting uh, point. Um, are there any preparatory prints for the 100 aspect series that showed that Yoshitoshi had input into how the colors are chosen for the prints? Off the top of my head, I can't think of any specifically for that for that series I can remember right now, but I'm sure there are because Yoshitoshi left behind a lot of drawings. Um, his teacher Kuniyoshi did as well that were assembled into albums by his pupils and Yoshitoshi left behind a lot as well. And in some of the, you know, many of them are sketches that are not you know, ready to be passed on to the block carver. But for the ones that are almost at that very final state, you, you do see color notations where there's, you know, a little line that says, you know, this bit blue, this bit purple. Um, so there definitely, you know, was some involvement there. And uh, one final question. Will these prints be part of an exhibition on this topic in the future? Um, I hope so, yes. Great. We We'll look forward to it. Um, um, so we are reaching the end of this program. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm pretty sure I'm going to prepare, you know, a fox costume for Halloween, I think, this year. Um, you can find more information on this and other events on our website, asia.si.edu slash events. Thank you again, Kit, uh, for this uh, captivating presentation. Additional questions and comments can be directed to our scholarly programs and publication department by emailing asiascholarlyprogram at si.edu. Thank you, have a nice day and stay safe. <laughs>